Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with chapter 6, the fundamentals of convection. We already did the first seven paragraphs of this chapter. It's about the physical mechanisms of convection, classifications of fluid flow, the velocity boundary layer, the thermal boundary layer, and we saw how equivalent the two are. Then laminar and turbulent flows, then heat and momentum transfer in turbulent flow, and then the derivations of the convection equations. Today we're going to continue with paragraph 6.8, the solutions of convective equations for a flat plate, and we're going to finish the rest of the chapter. Okay, so let's continue with paragraph 6.8, the solutions of convective equations for a flat plate. It starts by deriving the boundary layer thickness, which you already did in fluid mechanics. So we are not going to do it in detail, but I would like to highlight certain of the important things to show you the equivalence in terms of how it was done for the thermal boundary layer. Okay, so for the fluid boundary layer, schematically, this is the boundary layer for a fluid at the temperature T infinite and a velocity V. This plate is at the temperature Ts and this is our coordinate system Y and X and that is the boundary layer thickness which is a function of X. Okay. Now quite a few assumptions are made. First assumption is that the flow is laminar, laminar flow. Secondly, that it is steady. It's incompressible. Density is equal to constant. Constant properties. No viscous dissipation. No viscous dissipation. Or it is negligible in any case. Then the result of that is if we go and look at the continuity equation, the momentum equation and the energy equation, then it is going to reduce to the following format. And as I've mentioned, we are not going to do it now. We do not have the time for it. We've already done it in fluid mechanics. But that is just a little bit of a revision. So that is the continuity equation, how it is going to look like after we have made all those assumptions. The momentum equation is U multiplied by partial du dx plus V multiplied by partial du dy is equal to the kinematic viscosity multiplied by partial d2u dy squared. The momentum equation. And then the last one, the energy equation, which is equal to u partial dt dx plus v multiplied by partial dt dy is equal to alpha multiplied by partial d2t dy squared. Okay. Now to solve the boundary layer, you only need the first two equations, but we put the third equation with as we want to solve the thermal boundary layer also. Okay. So there are certain boundary conditions. We know that this is the velocities, that's the temperatures, we know what happens on the wall, etc. So you need the boundary conditions, which we're not going to discuss into detail, but what is being done is that the similarity variable eta is being defined which is equal to y multiplied by the square root of v multiplied by kinematic viscosity multiplied by x. Okay, now where, where does this thing come from? Well, from lots of trial and error and it's more of an art than a science. Okay, and Blasius did that a long time ago. So he defined the similarity variable so that he can then say 
that I need a function f, which is a function of this eta, the similarity variable, which is then equal to the stream function divided by the velocity multiplied by the square root of the kinematic viscosity multiplied by x. where u is then equal to the psi dy and v is equal to minus the psi dx. Okay. Something like that. The exact, math the exact mathematics is not so important now. It's the principle. Okay. The result of that is if we do all the substitutions and all the mathematical tricks then we can end up with the following differential equation, looking like this. 2 times d3f d eta plus f multiplied by d2f d eta squared is equal to 0. And let's call that equation 1. And that is a third order nonlinear differential equation. Now this needs to be solved numerically and there are many different methods that can be solved for example the Runga Kuta method we're also not going to do that but in the solution of that if you solve it numerically what happens is if you consider n and then f and then the f d eta the f d eta is equal to u divided by v and the numerical solution would show that for eta equals zero, then f would be equal to zero, and that would also be equal to zero. That is not so important. But if we do it for different values, then for example for two, you will get 0 0.650, and that value would be equal to 0 0.630. Okay, etc. Until we get to a certain value obviously you need to do the resolution much finer than I'm showing here maybe you'll have to do it to 0 0.01 so you can go and solve it for every 0 0.01 if you do that you're going to get to 4.91 what happens at 4.91 at 4.91 u divided by v is equal to 0 0.99 which is the definition of the boundary layer thickness you remember yesterday we said the boundary layer thickness is where the velocity u divided by the free stream velocity is 99%. That is where it comes from. So at 99, then that value is equal to 4.91. Now if we use this in here, we can get the boundary layer thickness. So the boundary layer thickness can then be written as, and if you clean it up a little bit, it's 4.91 divided by the square root of the velocity divided by the kinematic viscosity multiplied by x. Or as 4.91 divided by the square root of the local Reynolds number. Okay. where the local Reynolds number is equal to the velocity multiplied by x divided by the kinematic viscosity. Okay, and with this result, again I'm not showing you all the details, just the highlights, we can then also get the shear stress which is equal to 0.5. 332 multiplied by rho v square divided by the square root of the Reynolds number, the local Reynolds number, and we can get the skin friction coefficient, the local one, which is equal to 0.664 multiplied by the local Reynolds number to the minus a half. Okay, so 
So that you've done in fluid mechanics, I believe. Okay. Now we've got an additional equation. Okay. We've got an additional equation. Now to solve this additional equation, what happens is that we define the non-dimensionalized temperature theta. The non-dimensionalized temperature theta, which is a function of x and y, and that is equal to the temperature at any point t, which is a function of x, y, minus the surface temperature divided by t infinite minus t s. And we can, in principle, follow the same procedure as that what was done in the fluid mechanics. So the result is the equation 2 times d2 theta d eta squared plus prandtl f d theta d eta is equal to 0. And who is sharp? Who can see something right? Who can see something here? If you compare this differential equation with this differential equation, we've got the Prandtl number now in between, but the special case when the Prandtl number is equal to 1, the special case if the Prandtl number is equal to 1, then this solution and that solution will be the same. You agree? Okay. And when is the Prandtl number equal to 1? Well, for many cases in practice, typically most gases, close to 1 in any case. Okay, so if Prandtl is equal to 1, let's call it this equation 2, then equation 2 is equal to equation 1. That is if you don't want to go through all the mathematics, then you can say, well, maybe I'm working with air and I'm not even going to do the solution for the rest. Okay. But we are also interested in the cases where the Prandtl number is not equal to 1. Okay. And that would be for all the cases when the Prandtl number is larger than 0.6, which would obviously include the case where the Prandtl number is equal to 1. Okay, for that case, we can also do exactly the same, and then we can go and we can solve the Nusselt number, which is then equal to, take note, I put a footnote H there to indicate, it's the Nusselt number based on X, so it is the local heat transfer coefficient multiplied by X divided by K, which is equal then, if we solve it, equal to 0.332, multiplied by Prandtl to the third, Reynolds local to the x, and that would be valid for all Prandtl numbers larger than 0 0.6. Question? I don't understand how equation 1 and equation 2 can be equal because the order of the differentiation is not the same. It's third power, sorry, not third power, third order differential equation on the case of... Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't put in all the mathematics, but they, they are, although they don't look exactly the same here, they're in principle the same. If you can just go back in the textbook and just go and check, okay? Okay, okay so the Nusselt number is equal to 0 0.332 multiplied by Prandtl to the third Reynolds x to the half. And the result is that if we take the ratio of the boundary layer thickness divided by the thermal boundary layer thickness, then it is equal to Prandtl to the third. Now this Prandtl to the third, you're going to see everywhere in the course, and this is where it comes from. Okay. The ratio of the boundary layer thickness divided by the thermal boundary layer thickness is approximately, or in many cases, very close to Prandtl to the third. If we now go and solve the thermal boundary layer, then it is equal to the boundary layer thickness divided by Prandtl to the third, which means it is equal to 4.91 multiplied by x 
divided by Prandtl to the third multiplied by the square root of the Reynolds x. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you can just go and check, I'm not really sure if that x should be there. I think not, but just go and check in the textbook. Okay. So that is the thermal boundary layer thickness. And we can see that if we compare it to this one, the prandtl to the third now appears in the equation, but the rest they look all alike. Okay, now there's a paragraph 6.9 in the textbook which is about the non-dimensionalized convection equations and similarities which we are not going to do. Not that it is not important but you need to read that yourself. We do not have enough time to cover it all in class. And then paragraph 6.10 is the functional forms. And again, I'm not going to cover everything but I would like to highlight some of the most important results. Functional forms, paragraph 6.10. Okay. Now the functional forms is about, let's look at what happens in fluid mechanics versus heat transfer. Fluid mechanics versus heat transfer. In fluid mechanics, we are interested in getting forces. Okay. You design an aeroplane, you want to know what is the drag force or the lift force on the aeroplane. If somebody tells you the skin friction coefficient is equal to that, then it doesn't really mean something. You want to know what is the forces. In heat transfer, we normally would like to know what is the heat transfer rate. How many kilowatts? Okay. And the temperatures are important and the skin friction coefficients are important. And if you think back of two lectures ago when we said that let's look at a flat plate and flow over it. Then from practical experience and many measurements we know that the heat transfer rate is a function of the density of the fluid, the CP value of the fluid, the K of the fluid, and the viscosity of the fluid. Okay. It's a function of the velocity. It's a function of the surface temperature and the free stream temperature. It's a function of the area and the length. It's a function of the geometry. The geometry, is it a flat plate or is it a body like this? Okay, the geometry plays a role. Then also, the surface roughness, the surface roughness also influences the heat transfer rate. And then lastly, the type of fluid flow. And there we refer to is the flow laminar, is it in the transitional flow regime or is it turbulent flow? So all that influences the heat transfer rate. So if you go and do experiments and you would like to document the heat transfer rate as a function of all of that, then the test matrix is so large that it is not really very practical. And people have discovered that a long time ago by, say, by saying that <coughs> What we are actually interested in is the following. If we go and plot, not the forces, but rather CF as a function of Reynolds number, okay, for a body X. If we get that graph, and if we do the experiments with air, then it would also be valid for water the similarity. Okay. So you can save yourself thousands of experiments by making use of this relationship that CF 
is a function of the Reynolds number. Okay. Now in, in heat transfer, exactly the same. In heat transfer, they have discovered, again after doing lots of experiments, that if you plot the Nusselt number as a function of the Reynolds number, then unfortunately you can't get away with it. It is not enough. You have to do it for a certain Prandtl number. If you repeat the experiments for another Prandtl number, and you get this relationship, the Nusselt number as a function of Reynolds and Prandtl number, then you can get everything on one graph. Again, for a body, and let me write it here over it, for a body Y. Okay. So if we change the body to a body Z, another geometry, then you need another set of graphs. Okay. But in general, what has been found is that the Nusselt number is not only a function of the Reynolds number, but it is a function also of the Prandtl number. And in most cases, Prandtl to the third. Most cases, Prandtl to the third. Okay. So, in fluid mechanics, what we what people did is after they've done an experiment like that, they have did a curve fit and they wrote CF as a function of maybe a constant A multiplied by Reynolds to the square plus B multiplied by Reynolds plus a constant, something like that. And you as an engineer can go and design something if you've got the graph or if you have the equations. In heat transfer, most of the results can be written as the Nusselt number is equal to a constant multiplied by the Reynolds to the M and Prandtl to the N. Ninety-nine percent of the results can be written in that format. The Nusselt number is a constant multiplied by Reynolds to the M and Prandtl to the N. Okay. So if we go and do experiments, then we need to get M, and we need to get the constant, and we need to get N also. But as I've said, in most cases, N is approximately a third. Okay. The constant C is usually between 0 and 1. And M is also usually between 0 and 1. So most of the results can be written in that format. And you're going to see that a lot in the scores. Paragraph 6.11 is the analogies between momentum and heat transfer. The analogies between momentum and heat transfer. We're not going to do all the mathematics. Okay. It's in your textbook, you can go through it. But you will see that firstly there is a special case, and that is if the special case, as I've mentioned previously, if the Prandtl number is equal to 1, then Cf x multiplied by the Reynolds, multiplied by the length of the plate divided by 2, is equal to Nusselt x. So this connects fluid mechanics and heat transfer with each other shows us there's an analogy between the two. And the reason why it is written in this format is you will see that all, let's call it the fluid mechanics stuff is on the left hand side and the heat transfer stuff is on the right hand side. You see. So what does it mean? It means that if you do fluid mechanics experiments, if you go and do this experiments, and without taking one single temperature measurement, 
or heat transfer measurement. Just by getting the forces, you can also get the results for the heat transfer side. Okay, one of those things in nature. Perfect analogy between heat transfer and fluid mechanics. Okay, now it can also be written in different formats. formats. For example, it can be written as CFX divided by 2 is equal to the Stanton number. The Stanton number. And the Stanton number, Stanton number is equal to the heat transfer coefficient divided by rho CP multiplied by the velocity or it is equal to the Nusselt number divided by the Reynolds number divided by the Prandtl number. <coughs> Stanton number is the Nusselt number divided by the Reynolds number multiplied by the Prandtl number. Okay. Now this is the special case if the Prandtl number is equal to 1. For other Prandtl numbers, Okay, for other Prandtl numbers, we can now make use of the fact that previously we've said that the friction coefficient is equal to 0.664 multiplied by Reynolds x to minus a half. Let's call that equation 3. And we've derived that the Nusselt number is equal to 0.332 multiplied by Reynolds uh, 0.332 multiplied by Prandtl to the third multiplied by Reynolds x to the half. Equation 4. Okay. If we now take equation 3 divided by equation 4 okay. then we've got CFX divided by the Nusselt number is equal to 0.664 multiplied by Re Reynolds X to the minus of divided by 0.332 Prandtl to the third Reynolds X to minus a half So we can say that CFX divided by the Nusselt number is equal to 0.664 divided by 0.332 is equal to 2. Okay. 2 times divided by this Reynolds X to the minus a half, if we take it, oh sorry this one must be plus a half, minus a half, if we take it down then it must be equal to the Reynolds number multiplied by Prandtl to the third. And that equation can be written in many different formats. You can write it as CFX multiplied by the Reynolds number divided by 2, all the fluid mechanics stuff on the left hand side is equal to the heat transfer stuff on the right hand side, the Nusselt number X to the Prandtl to the minus a third. Or in terms of a Stanton number, go and manipulate it a little bit. See if x divided by 2 is equal to the Stanton number Prandtl to the 2 thirds. And that is also known as the Colbin J factor. Corbin J factor. Ok, 
Okay, and this is called the modified Reynolds analogy, or it is also called the chilton colburn analogy. People who originally did this work. Okay. The modified Reynolds analogy, or the colburn chilton analogy. It shows that there's a relationship between heat transfer and fluid mechanics. And what is also nice about it is that although it is written here as local values, if you would do it for a total body and you consider the average values, then it also works for the average values also. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen, on the theory? Okay, let's do an example. Example. It's an example where we have a flat plate. Okay, this flat plate is suspended in air and over it we have the air at 20 degrees Celsius and 7 meters per second flowing over the flat plate. And it flows over the flat plate, not only on the top side, but also on the body, on the bottom side, so on both sides of the flat plate. Okay. And we measure the drag force on the plate. And the drag force is equal to 0.86 newtons. And this flat plate is 3 meters in length and 2 meters in terms of its width. 3 by 2 meters flat plate. And we have to determine the Nusselt number on the flat plate. Okay, so let me just repeat the question. We've got this flat plate, it is suspended in air, and we've got air which is blown over it. The air temperature is 20 degrees Celsius, the velocity is 7 meters per second, and we measure the force, the drag force on the plate, which is 0.86 newtons. So although we say it is air at 20 degrees Celsius, we actually do not have any temperature measurements at all. <coughs> so just by using the fluid mechanics characteristics, we now want to determine the Nusselt number by making use of this analogy relationship between heat transfer and fluid mechanics. Right. Let's just write down the properties of air as we're going to use it. Properties of air at 20 degrees Celsius is the back of your textbook. And it is the density is equal to 1.204 kilograms per cubic meters. Cp is equal to 1.007 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Trondel number is equal to 0 0.7309 and the thermal conductivity K must be equal to 0 0.02514 watts per meter Kelvin. So those are all the properties. Now the shear stress on a plate is equal to the skin friction coefficient multiplied by rho v squared divided by 2. But they didn't give us the skin friction, they gave us the force. But that is easy, okay. because the force is equal to tau multiplied by the area of the plate. Okay. Newtons per square meter, which is the same as pressure, which is pascals, multiplied by the area, gives us the force. The shear stress multiplied by the area gives us the force. So, 
we can say it is equal to CF multiplied by the area which is equal, multiplied by rho V squared divided by 2 and that would then give us the force on the flat plate. Okay, now the force is equal to 0.86 meters, 0.86 newtons. Okay, CF is what we want to determine, skin friction coefficient. The surface area of the plate is 2 times 2 multiplied by 3 because it's on both sides of the plate. Both sides of the plate multiplied by the density which is equal to 1.204 multiplied by the velocity which is 7 meters per second divided by 2 from which we can solve the skin friction coefficient as 0 0.00243 0.00243 Okay. If we now look at the chilton colburn analogy, then CF divided by 2 is equal to the Staunton number, Prandtl to the 2 thirds. Okay. Where the Staunton number is equal to the heat transfer coefficient divided by rho CP multiplied by V. If we put that in there, then we, can, then we can get that CF divided by 2 is equal to the heat transfer coefficient divided by rho CPV multiplied by Prandtl to the 2 thirds. Okay, CF is equal to 0.00243 divided by 2 is equal to the heat transfer coefficient divided by the density which is equal to 1.204 multiplied by CP and CP where is Andrea today? Andrea not here is equal to 1.007 Remember, it's kilojoules okay. multiplied by the velocity which is 7 <coughs> multiplied by the Prandtl number. The Prandtl number is 0.739 divided to the power of 2 thirds from, from which we can solve the heat transfer coefficient as 12.71 watts per square meter degree Celsius. The missile number is then equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the length of the plate divided by the thermal conductivity of the fluid the Nusselt number is equal to 12.71. The length of the plate is 3 meters divided by the thermal conductivity of the fluid 0.02514 and that is equal to 1516. Okay. So if we look at this problem what this problem is all about is the fact that all the fluid mechanics data is given to us and then we can end up with all the heat transfer data. What does it mean if the Nusselt number is equal to 1516? <coughs> Remember the Nusselt number tells us how much the heat transfer is enhanced in comparison with conduction heat transfer. It is the ratio of the convection divided by the conduction. So it means that if we, if we were in a situation where there were no velocity, it's just the air, and gravity is equal to zero, where the heat transfer would have been only by conduction, 
then the fact that we've got the air blowing over it at 7 meters per second is going to increase the heat transfer rate with about 1,500 times. So that is what the Nusselt number tells us. And that is why the Nusselt number cannot be less than 1. Okay. If it is equal to 1, it means that the heat transfer is by conduction only. Ladies and gentlemen, any questions? Okay, thank you Lloyd.